All right, let's see if I can get the screen to share. Oh. So firstly, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that the Ghana people are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region, which my feet are on. I recognise their cultural, spiritual, physical and emotional connection to the land. I honour and pay my respects to Ghana elders, past, present and to the future. I imagine a lot of us today on this webinar are on Ghana land, but if you'd like to pop in the chat um, where you're zooming in from, if it's somewhere different, um, you're quite welcome to do so. So if you haven't joined us for a Spotlight series before, um, HDSA Spotlight series is an initiative um, launched in November 2021 as a way to build knowledge and capacity in a range of essential research translation skills and topics which may not be well understood um, by the broader community. We do this through a month-long focused education initiative, which includes four online webinars. So this is the second of four today. Um, and we hear from a range of experts and we also dedicate our socials um, to sharing resources throughout the month. So um, this is probably a good opportunity if you're not following us on LinkedIn and Twitter to make sure that you do that um, at some point today as well. So this is actually our seventh Spotlight series. Um, and some of our previous series have covered topics like implementation science, research impact, community engagement, the MRFF, health economics and patient reported measures. And if you wanna go and watch any of the previous Spotlight series or check out any of those resources, um, all of that's available on our website. And in case you haven't heard of us before, um, Health Translation SA is an NHMRC accredited research translation centre. We offer a collaborative cross-sectorial approach to research and enabling translation of findings into improved patient care. Essentially, we seek to connect health researchers and health services with the right stakeholders and partners to accelerate the implementation of research discoveries. We have 11 academic research and healthcare agency partners, uh, which encompass the breadth of health service delivery across South Australia. Um, and here's just another slide that shows a few bits and pieces that we're involved in and the Spotlight series obviously falls um, into our education and training, although this Spotlight series obviously crosses over into the policy section as well. So today we're really fortunate to have two policy experts presenting for us. Um, we have Carmel Williams and we also have Kristen Carson Shahood, um, who will cover Influencing Policy 101. Now, Carmel unfortunately had to attend a funeral today, um, which was very unfortunate, but um, she was so generous to actually pre-record her presentation for us before today. So um, in a moment, we're going to start off with Carmel's presentation pre-recorded, and then um, we're fortunate enough to have Kristen joining us live as well um, for the presentation after that. Um, so we're going to have two presentations and then at the end we'll have around 15 minutes for Q&A. Now it's obviously just going to be Kristen and I on Q&A, but we do welcome um, all of your questions during that time. So if you think of any, feel free to pop them in the chat throughout. Um, for background, I'll briefly introduce both of our speakers today. So Carmel is the Director for the Centre for Health in All Policies Research Translation, jointly based in Health Translation SA and the School of Public Health at the University of Adelaide. The centre has been established to bridge the gap between the generation of research and its application to policy and practice. Carmel works as a policy entrepreneur to address complex policy issues, navigating across sectors and systems to deliver good public policy outcomes that contribute to improved health, wellbeing and health equity. Kristen has worked as a research scientist with SA Health and universities for almost 20 years, leading programs of work in tobacco control, respiratory health, mental health and wellbeing, disease prevention, smartphone app development, and more. She has a PhD in medicine from the University of Adelaide and a Master of Science in Public Policy and Management from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Kristen is the director of the Howard Research Group, a scientific and medical consulting company that specialises in helping people to develop behaviour change programs through end user co-design, building digital solutions using apps, augmented reality and artificial intelligence and synthesising evidence to inform policy, clinical guidelines and research grants. So just a few, just a few things there. Um, so as discussed, I'm going to start off by um, sharing the presentation that Carmel has made for us today. So I'll just start that off now. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be here today. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm not here today. I'm recording this today because unfortunately, I've had a family um, event that's required me to go to a funeral tomorrow. So I'm um, recording this and I, I hope that you'll um, uh, that it'll that'll work really nicely um, with uh, along with Kirsten's presentation. So thank you to Kirsten um, for carrying on without me. 
Um, so my name is Carmel Williams and I have a long history of working as a policy maker in the public health prevention space. And so today I'm going to be reflecting on um, what I've learned around policy making and the role of evidence in policy making um, over, over the course of those years. So to start with, I think it's really helpful for us to think about what policy is. And I think for many people, policy is um, an ill-defined and nebulous concept um, and, and uh, it, you know, it can conjure up all different sorts of, of ideas. But simply put, policy is really a course of action. It's a plan to take a course of action. And it can be done by um, a wide range of different organisations. People often think of policy with government, but policy occurs at multiple levels um, across our society. Large business, small business will have policy, um, education institutions, schools, child care centres, they'll all have policy. And so I think if we think of policy more as a, a, a planned course of action, um, I think that can really help us understand that it that it's it's it doesn't have to be a complex, hard to define concept. When thinking about what we mean by policy, um, it's important and helpful to understand um, the series of players and stakeholders engaged and the different kind of um, factors that influence it. And here you can see on the slide that um, Walton Gibson some time ago really decided, it really proposed that policy can be thought of as being influenced by a number of factors. The context, so what is the um, environmental context in which the policy is being formed? And this varies, of course, over time. So the context 30 years ago when we were developing policy, um, that the, the threat of climate change wasn't probably as, as um, urgent and, and, as, um, and, and as powerful as it is today. So that context has changed. Then the content. So what is the policy? What is the course of action? What is the plan that it's trying to tackle? What's the issue that it's trying to address? And then the process. So how are we going about forming this plan? Who is involved in forming the plan? Is it something that's handed from top down? Does, is it decided by the chief executive of the business and then instructed for all of the employees to implement? Or is it a collaborative um, co-design process? All of these things influence and shape, um, shape the nature of the policy being developed. And in the middle of this triangle um, is the critical actors who are all of the players who are influenced and have or, um, some power to shape the policy. At the heart of policy, even if it's within a business corporation or a local community school or a local community group, um, there's always politics and, and the role of relationships and, and power. And so I think this is really what this diagram is trying to highlight. But if we move forward, um, and perhaps we move on to defining what we really mean by a policy, as I said, it's a high level plan. Um, and it really kind of outlines the goals and the processes and procedures to achieve that plan. And the policy makers are the people who are actually developing and, and shaping and implementing the plan. And these can be, as I've also said, can be central or local government. Local government implements lots of policies, but also so does state and federal government multinational companies or local um, businesses, schools and hospitals. And when you think about who are the people that are actually um, making the final decisions on, on policies, um, they're sometimes referred to as the policy elites. And these are really the people who have high positions in the organisation and, and have the ability to decide exactly how the policy is finally shaped and implemented. I think it's also important to understand that the policy process um, is, is developed, initiated, negotiated and communicated and evaluated, but it takes a really long time. Um, it's not always a fast process and it's quite iterative and, and can change over time. 
If we move on from policy, and now we talk about public policy, which is really what I'm most concerned with sharing with you today, um, is that this is really what governments do. So if we think through what the policy process was that I've outlined more broadly, then we apply those kind of understandings and knowledge to this is the decision making processes of government. And when we think about government, again, I think we need to be thinking about government at multiple levels. So we want to think about the hierarchy of government institutions, in particular in Australia, that's federal, state and local. All of those organisations make public policy. But we also want to think about subsets of some government departments, so schools, hospitals, health services, they all um, are involved in either the development or the implementation and evaluation of, of, of policy. And so public policy is really a response to um, a problem that's been identified that requires attention. I think it's important for us to remember that in public policy, the policy is being made by government on behalf of the public. And if you look to the right of this slide, I think that's correct, um, you can see a little framework here that outlines kind of the relationship between government, society, the development of policy, the evaluation of policy and the feedback loops. So it's really important that government should be responding to and also leading discussions and, and challenges around what are the important things for society to address the complex problems that many of us face. It's orientated towards a goal. It's designed to, to improve things or to resolve a, a complex problem. So it can involve things from setting strategic agendas, setting strategic plans, but it can also be addressing an issue such as um, waste management issues. Um, I've just been at another event where we've been talking about um, the goal of trying to have zero landfill by 2030. So that's a policy position by that government agency and they're now working towards implementing that goal. Um, I think the other thing it's really, um, even though government is responsible for public policy, to reinforce that the ideas often around what the problems are or how to address those problems comes from others, can come from outside of government. And this is where non-government sector, civil society, and, and the academic community can play a really important role in identifying what are the problems, what's the depth of the problems or what the issues are and proposing those and presenting them to government. I guess an important part of um, the research translation implementation process. And policy making in itself doesn't really have a clear beginning, middle and end. It's sort of, an, as I said, an iterative ongoing process and decisions that we made at multiple points along the system. And we can talk about that um, in, a, in a bit further in the session. Um, and in, in an ideal world, we really want to be reassessing, revisiting and revising the policies to make sure they're fit for purpose and that, they, that they're working within the context of, of um, the current environment. And if you think about what actually is a policy, um, so oftentimes it's a document, um, but sometimes it can actually be a decision that then um, uh, has implications for funding or, or it can be the delivery of services. And if we, we categorise them here into kind of three, three main um, main types. So regulatory, which is usually done through legislation. So an example here would be um, tobacco legislation. And you probably have been hearing the conversations around vaping and moves to sort of thinking about how we might be able to change the legislative regulatory environment to um, minimise the uptake of vaping by our young people. Um, and it's it's about imposing restrictions or trying to influence the actions of the public through legislative responses. Distributive is um, the provision of services, which is mostly what government does. So the division, the provision of health services, the provision of education services, the provision of, of um, emergency food relief, emergency 
emergency services for those at a disadvantage. This is sort of distributive and this is what the bulk of what government departments do. And, and it's actually a policy. This is the government's response to, to solve problems in the community. And redistributive is the um, is more controversial because that's when actually we take funds and resources from one segment of society and redistribute them to other segments of society. So our tax system is redistributive. Um, the um, the levies that we put on certain things is also redistributive. So so these things are about shifting wealth, and this is obviously much more convert controversial um, because. You know, obviously there are some winners and losers. And I think if we think about the how these things impact, how these three public policy approaches influence or impact the health of our population and the provision and delivery of health services and the ability of research to be able to influence and shape each of these things, you can you can think of um, that the health system involves all three categories. And so as um, as practitioners and, and academics and policy people and, and health professionals wanting to influence the policy process, we really need to be thinking about how we can operate and influence at each of these three levels. So what's the process of policy making? So it's really about problem solving. And I think what I perhaps haven't said clearly enough yet is that it's shaped very importantly by institutional, political, economic and other contexts. So the um, the culture of the institution in which you're operating, is it a command and control organisation or is it an organisation that's got a more democratic, distributed kind of governance structure will really influence how public policy making can be made. So if you think at, at a very global level, and you can think of governments in other countries who have perhaps um, less democratic processes, um, that shapes the nature of the policy making process. But here in Australia, we have a democratic process where obviously the voices of citizens and, and and uh, um, other parts of our community can help and shape and influence the policy making process. Economics is playing a very important role um, in deciding around what public policy gets up, um, the cost of actually providing services um, is, is an important um, contributor and a driver of changes in public policy. And I guess an example here would be if we think about the role of the NDIS and how critically important that's been for those people who are living with a disability. But now the NDIS is considered to be economically unsustainable. And so um, political conversations are occurring around how the NDIS might be able to be modified and adapted so that actually the um, cost burden to future generations is more manageable. And so those things, are, those conversations are being shaped by political ideology, political forces, by people with lived experience of disability and people with lived experience of um, being on the NDIS and accessing the NDIS and then other economic drivers, other, um, other drivers who are contesting and perhaps would like to see some of those funds spent on other, other types of services or used in other ways. Um, and I think this next point is really about recognising that the private private actors, private sector and the public sector will bring their own values and their own interpretations of the problem. And that, that interpretation of the problem really has an important role to play in how people identify the solutions. What are the solutions they identify? Um, and if you, if you only have one set of voices in the room to shape and determine what the problem is, then you're going to get a narrow set of solutions. And it's also recognising that people come with their own beliefs and motivations and that we need to understand that when we're thinking about public policy making. So the other thing to think about is what governments don't do is also a policy decision. It's an implicit policy decision rather than an explicit one. And an example here would be that if we reflect on the role of um, 
on how we've addressed climate change, you know, between 2007 and 2022, that actually climate change wasn't something that the federal government really wanted to address. So that was a policy decision, but they didn't have a policy agenda on it. And so I think recognising that governments deciding not to do something is also a policy decision is helpful and useful to be thinking about. And I've highlighted here that I just, and I'll say this repeatedly over my, my brief time with you, is that we must remember that the policy making process is inherently political. And by that, I mean little p political between different individuals, different groups, different um, agencies, different government departments, different sections of government, but it's also big P political in terms of political discourse, political ideology, political value systems, and these things will all shape how the problem is framed and um, what the potential solutions are. And this is a little example, I do love this diagram, that really highlights that that you can get a diverse set of perceptions and views around how to solve a problem. And it really depends on what it is that you think the problem is. So if you start, you can see that the customer really wanted a swing, but they didn't explain it very well. Um, and then you can move on. Um, I do particularly like how the analyst designed it, um, which is obviously completely nonsensical. Um, and then you've got a, um, and then you, you look at what the customer really needed. And um, and so I think you can see here, this is really supposed to highlight that different voices will see the problem differently and that as a consequence of that, you get a different solution. And so one of the important elements of public policy making is to make sure you have diverse views, diverse ideas in the room, helping to shape, to define the problem and then to help solve, identify solutions. Why should we care about policy? Well, it's because actually it's central to the organisation of and management of problems in our society. It's how authority is exercised. Government exercises the authority that the public gives it through the election process, through the democratic governance process, and they influence that, they exercise that through, through the delivery of policy. And it's about how resource, and importantly, it's about how resources and money are used and what supports are put in place to implement policy. So, you know, government is use it, redistributes our, our taxes to um, help address the, the problems or, or the, the needs that we see collectively as a society. And if we want to shape how those resources are distributed, who receives them, how they're delivered, you know, how our education system's delivered, how our health service is delivered, we need to understand and engage in the policy process. And we need to recognise um, where are the levers for us to be able to influence and shape um, uh, how, what governments decide to do and how we can use those to improve health outcomes. Thought I'd quickly touch on the policy cycle. This is the Australian policy cycle. Um, it looks like a really lovely organised cylindrical um, process where you start at the bottom to identify the issues, you move through a natural policy analysis process, you then look at those instruments I talked about, um, you know, whether you go with regulation legislation, whether you go with services or whether you go with redistributive, you then consult, you, then, you, then you implement, evaluate. Um, and I mean, I think what this diagram doesn't show you is that actually the policy making process is really fraught with differences of ideology and opinion. And really oftentimes when you're going through the policy making process, you're really, you're managing the conflict and trying to look for those opportunities for a win-win situation. But at the heart of it, policy making is about a struggle over ideas. And, um, and that actually, when, if we're recognising that we're touching on belief systems and um, and that actually we need to be thinking about engaging in the relationships and, and that actually these belief systems and these relationships are really about an, inter an interface between the state, the market and the individual. In reality, this is what the policy making cycle looks like. It's very messy, really complicated, and um, it takes a long time often. 
So now if we quickly think about where does evidence sit within the policy making process, um, the, the reality is evidence can be incorporated at every stage of the policy cycle, but it tends to be um, used most at the evaluation. If you're a researcher, you've probably been called in by a policy colleague to help them evaluate a policy. What we really need to be doing is using policy, is using evidence at every stage. We need to be ident using evidence to help work out what needs to be on the policy agenda. What are the problems that need addressing? So loneliness would be a new and emerging issue that I think researchers have really helped to highlight. And so that is beginning to get some policy attention. We also want to be using evidence to help identify and judge what are the best responses to the problem, what are the best interventions, and then we need to be thinking about are those interventions being implemented well, how can we use evidence to make sure those interventions are implemented well, and then obviously evaluation. But I think evidence oftentimes is not used in policy making, um, and I think that can be a surprise for researchers, but um, evidence in policy making can be a privilege. You don't always have time, you don't always have capacity, and there's not always interest from the decision makers. And just using this example here, I won't go into it more detail, but this is just an example of complexity in policy making. It's the, foren the foresight obesogenic environment. And if you're a policy maker trying to address obesity, just being presented with this evidence, it would be hard to know where you should be putting your energy into what, what's the policy solution here. So that's just to give you an example about some of the challenges from policy makers' perspective. But I think if one of the things that's important to kind of highlight, and I've only got a few minutes left, um, is that actually evidence and policy making, um, it's really important that because policy makers have limited capacity to, uh, in terms of time, they need they need the evidence when they when when their ministers are calling for for a, a briefing, um, and that you we they don't have time to digest you know, 300 page reports into um, what's three dot points. I mean, this this cartoon is is completely accurate. Um, six bullet points is more than actually we've often got in, in my experience. We've had to summarize um, uh, a whole complex problem into three dot points um, on, on the front page of a briefing, and, and it's possible that a minister will never get past that. So being able to write pithily, identify what are the critical elements and summarise that, that's really important into a policy brief. And we'll be able to talk more about that in the next session in a few weeks' time. So just here's just a smattering of factors that drive policy making. And you can see um, that actually evidence is only, scientific evidence is only one of the few things that influences policy. And that we we need to be understanding that policy making uh, and that evidence has to compete and contest um, to be able to be incorporated into the policy making environment. And this is my last slide, and I just I just wanted to remind people that actually what we're all working towards is having impact, and that means that we need to be taking ideas and evidence and shaping it in ways that are accessible, um, that provide insight and wisdom. Thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope the rest of the session goes well. We're extremely appreciative that Carmel was able to um, was able to pre-record that presentation for us. I don't know about you all watching, but I certainly wrote down heaps of things from that presentation. Um, I think probably one of the highlights for me was governments deciding not to do something is in itself a policy decision. I think that's really insightful. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning at this point too that Carmel will be involved in our later Spotlight Series session. So if you want to hear some more information about that, um, jump on our website and you can find some info about how to get involved. So with that, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker, Kristen. So Kristen, I'll just let you get set up and get your slides shared and then um, feel free to take it away. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everybody, as well, for, for joining um, us today for this session. I'll just start with sharing slides. Okay, so I hope you can all see that and I'm sharing the right screen. Um, so building on um, Carmel's work, I'm now going to go into a bit more of the, the practical aspect, I guess, of how to build a policy-focused research project. 
Um, but first off, uh, it might be useful to know actually who am I? Uh, so I did a PhD in medicine with the University of Adelaide. I've got a master's of um, public policy and management. I've produced a few research outputs. I'm director of research at the Women's and Children's Hospital, the respiratory and sleep medicine department, but also director of um, the consulting company, Hood Research Group. I spent six years leading research groups at UniSA and 14 years working in SA Health. Um, I'm also mum to three kids. And am I a policy expert? No, actually, I wouldn't say I am. In short, health translation SA with Jasper. Uh, perhaps not quite, but really the lens that I'm bringing for this is based on my practical experience and some of the, the pitfalls and things that have worked well while I've tried to navigate this research and policy space. So on that note, the first question I have to ask is why are you here? Why do you want to influence policy? So have a think about that for yourselves and see if you can actually answer that question. It could be because you're already aware of a specific policy that needs to be changed. Maybe it's because you want to make impact through your work. Is it part of, you know, you need to have a well-rounded research project. So this is the obvious translation component that you want to address. Is it about maximising chances for grant funding? We know those investigator grants can be pretty nasty, especially for the first part when you're trying to demonstrate impact of your work. This might be a way you're thinking of trying to address that. Is it because it sounds good and your mum would like it? There, are, Believe it or not, I've actually had people say that to me. Um, there's lots of reasons why, but is it the best fit for your project and for you? So... Why you? Why are you the one wanting to do this? And this goes back to what Karma was saying as well. What weight does your voice hold to influence policy? And this isn't just about you, but you can extend it to your team. And who's going to care about it? Do you already have people that you work with? Have you influenced policy before? Do you know who the key stakeholders are? Is there another way you should be approaching this? to get the same goal and outcome. And the reason I think this is important to really understand upfront is because many people will say, right, I'm going to have a policy implementation phase as part of my research, but it may actually not be the best point to start. So I would suggest the first thing you need to do is get a good idea of the landscape around you and understand if influencing policy is in fact the best thing that you should be starting with. Because there are a lot of other ways to potentially meet goals, such as commercialization, industry partnership. And I guess this leads into where I started with all of this. So after doing my PhD with the University of Adelaide, and I was working at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital at the time, I, like many PhD students, was a bit naive that I was going to change the world through my research, as we all do. Um, so I did a randomised control trial with about 400 patients across three hospitals. And we followed them up for two years. Half of them got a medication to help them quit smoking, veronicline, plus quit line counselling. The other half got quit line counselling alone. And what we could see uh, with our research is compared to unassisted quit attempts, where the 12-month success rate is between 3 and 5%, we could increase the chances of successful quitting tenfold for our intervention group. So this was in, this was huge. And I thought, wow, I'm going to change policy. Again, being completely naive. Um, for the quit line counselling alone group, all I did was make a five-minute phone call at the patient's bedside. So I thought, oh, my gosh, this is easy. This is so going to be adopted. No problems at all. Um, once again, didn't quite work that way. And... I remember at the time the health minister uh, was John Hill and he was giving a presentation at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and I went up to him after the talk because I was too scared to put my hand up at the time um, and actually spoke to him about, look, you know, I've got this project where we've just shown that we could increase the rates of uh, quitting smoking in hospitals. I was really nervous. 
But believe it or not, just going up to him and having that conversation, he was actually engaged. And he said, you know what, let's meet up and I want you to come to Parliament House and show me the results of your work. And I thought, right, you know, my policy break. This is the way we're going to get in. So my supervisor and I went to Parliament House, showed him the results. He presented them at Parliament too, um, Minister Hill. And that was it. Nothing more happened. And this is where I became really disheartened. And I thought, right, what am I doing wrong? Um, in short, lots of things, including not really considering the translation pathway from the outset and getting those people engaged. No one really knew that we were doing this work. Um, or it was also me not understanding what, how this could be implemented. What did it actually look like if it were to be a model that would be used in standard care? Again, so many things. But that's what led to me undertaking the Masters in Public Policy and Management because I thought, right, I need to understand this better. So I did the uh, degree with Carnegie Mellon, which was two years while still working, and thought, right, after this, I'm going to understand it. I'm going to know what I'm doing. I'm going to be able to influence policy. Again, naive because the, I guess, one-sentence summary of what that means, it's political. Like Karma was saying, there's there uh, it's more flavor of the month. It's more what the policy agenda is. It's who you know. And again, we'll come to that in a moment. But for the rest of this talk, I just want to go through three key things. So how do we build that policy focused project? Well, firstly, where do we start? Understand the landscape, and then let's do some actionable things. So this is the typical research cycle, right? Write the grant, get the money, do the research, publish results. Unfortunately, many times, like with me, I wasn't considering the translation aspect of this. Um, and unfortunately, the research cycle never quite works this way either because, you know, many, again, many times I'm doing the research, there are tangents that happen, like my talk right now, um, but we find ourselves calling those results preliminary, write the grant, to do what we already did, get the money and actually use that money to do something else. Or we've got a project, but there's lots of little things happening at the same time. So then how do we fit the translation part in all of this? Well, the reality is we need to be starting now, today. Every stage of what you're doing as a researcher, if you want to influence policy, should have a policy lens involved in it, in some capacity. The more, the better. So there was that study and several economists and people have said this over the years, you know, there's that 17 year lag between doing research and actually it getting used in practice. And this is why it was so disconcerting for me that my research didn't actually translate into meaningful policy from the outset. And I remember when I did my master's in public policy course, one of the policy professors said to me, there was a, a study over in the, oh, this this big deal over in the US about 15 years ago where there was a problem and the government got a panel of experts together, something like 50 experts, to come up with what needs to happen. And these experts, after several months of deliberation, produced this document with these are the essential recommendations of what needs to change. These are the ones that would be nice but not essential and these are just some additional options. And the government ended up implementing three of the additional option ones and none of the essential or base recommendation ones. Why? And again, there's lots of reasons why political decisions are made and policy decisions are made. It could be funding. It could be that there, need, there needs to be seen as doing something. It, there's just so many aspects of the political landscape and agenda. So how do we navigate this? Well, where do we start with it? Obviously, research grants might be a good place. And again, it's really important if you are trying to influence policy, that even into your grants, even before you design your research question for your grants, that you start having the conversations with key stakeholders for who's going to influence policy. So have policymakers as investigators and partners on the grant. Um, and use a consultation throughout to inform not just the research question, but the methodology, the outcomes, how it will be translated. 
include appropriate translation methodology and goals. So re-aim framework is one where you're looking at the reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance, because you can then use these types of research, these frameworks to inform policy for implementation or upscale or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve for your goals. And include things in there as well to maximize the feasibility of your, you doing this and actually effectively doing something in policy. Because I see many uh, research proposals through NHMRC as a reviewer where there's blanket statements, I'm going to change policy or I've changed policy um, with my work. But if you actually look into it in a bit more detail, there's no real clear structure or approach or track record of how you're going to achieve this. Ways you can do it is to make sure that if you are going to incorporate policy, that you've got a budget allocation for it too. So as an example, Health Translation SA have been on many of my grant applications where I have a budget item allocated to them to help me inform the evidence translation process, connect with key policy actors and find ways throughout the grant period or project period to actually build that actionable policy approach, if that makes sense. It is, in short, policy is not something that is typically set. It changes and evolves over time. So it needs to be a dynamic process. Consider um, with positions of team, for example, I've been a board director for the Thoracic Society of Australia, New Zealand for four years. I stepped down uh, beginning of this year. And many of the opportunities I've had to influence policy have been through that role because we get a lot of advocacy um, efforts with people coming to us, governments coming to us as a society to inform on policy positions. Uh, with my background in tobacco, of course, a lot of this is to do with the tobacco control strategy. And of course, consider the track record, show evidence of where you have influenced policy before and what kind of impact has that had? Another way to do it is if you've already got your research findings, or if you're still early on in the process, to actually create policy briefs. Have a go even at trying to map it out. And again, this is, again, back to what Carmel was saying, there's many stages of the policy cycle where you can action here. So the policy agenda, you might have um, an interventional action that you want to occur and include options of how that could be achieved with different costs associated with it. It could be around the implementation part. So what's that going to look like? And give them steps for how to do this. But again, keep it brief, keep it simple. Another way to start is to communicate. Uh, like I said, professional organisations like Thoracic Society in my case, um, or providing summaries directly to the policy writers. Do you know who the policy writers are in your field? Because again, that would be pretty important to know early on. Who else can help you do this? So like I said, Health Translation SA is um, something that I've used quite often. Um, we also do this type of work through Hood Research where we help to design some of these approaches for how best to create impact with the type of work that's done and often the co-design process and incorporating that early on with who identifying who are the key stakeholders and what kind of role could they have and what kind of impact do you really want to have? But there are many others uh, like us and like Health Translation SA as well that it'll be worth investigating a bit of time to understand. So speaking of understanding, what is the landscape like? Like I said, who are the key, what are the key policies in your field? Who controls them? What, who are the actors? And do you have any connections to them? So government departments for different areas, health, education, infrastructure, the professional bodies and organisations, and you've got policies also in businesses, schools, hospitals. There's so many areas where you can influence policy. Now, with the key stakeholders, something that really resonates with me is it's not just about do you know who they are? It's important. But if you don't know, does somebody in your team know who they are? But more importantly than any of that, do they know you? And this is about promotion of your work, being seen. It's about networking. Once you know who the key stakeholders are, what are their needs? 
And this is really important to understand something that I struggled with and constantly get um, wrapped over the knuckles about when trying to pitch my work to policymakers. Understand the political agenda and understand how outcomes of our research can fill the evidence gaps and actually inform the agenda. So with the key policymakers, again, look at politicians that often have short-term goals, which is, again, why my study um, for the smoking trial wasn't really of interest because what I could show, even with a health economic evaluation of my work, is over time we could save costs for the health system. And, again, that's great, but not for a politician who's got a really short window to show impact, otherwise they're out of office. So why are they going to care? And again, like Carmel said, they're inundated with so much information. And often their time has to get addressed about putting out, you know, putting out fires, um, you know, things that are in the media, you know, someone dying in hospital that has a big community impact. Um, it doesn't mean that evidence is going to be used. So what's the politician or key stakeholders personal story as well? Um, does they have do they have a child with asthma? Is your area of work asthma? Something like that might be able to, it could mean that you could target your work for a particular politician because they're, more, they're going to be more receptive to what you're saying. And what are their portfolio goals? So again, right now, uh, Chris Picton, the health minister in SA, his uh, past track record was with, with Nicola Roxon on plain packaging for cigarettes. So he's got an interest in this space, a background here. And the portfolio goals now are around reducing the impact of tobacco use, especially now with e-cigarettes and vaping. And of course, what's the flavour of the month? Again, young kids vaping in schools, uh, all these types of things mean that that's quite topical. But for many years, it hasn't been. And I was indeed turned, I was, had people say to me, why are you doing tobacco? It, it's, you know, going out of fashion, it's not going to get funding. And then all of a sudden, the policy window changes. So why would they listen to you? You know, make sure that you have the right experts in your team. Make sure that they're known by the policymakers. And make sure you have a plan about how you're going to translate those findings. And again, importantly, what could you do now to try and improve your existing relationships? Did you already act with policymakers when creating your question, when creating your existing work? If not, again, now's the time to start. Is your research enough to change policy? Do you know what's required to change the policy you're trying to change if you already know what it is? Because it might not be one RCT that's going to be enough. So if it's not, what else is needed and how do you get your hands on it? Is it about the evidence? Is it about needing more trials? What actually would be needed to do this? But if yours is enough, how can you make sure it's actually used and adopted? And again, this is what we're going back to with the policy window, making sure that you've got all of this ready to go because it might not be time now, just like it wasn't for me when I did my PhD uh, back in 2011 when I first started it. Tobacco was not in the policy window for the most part. Now it is. Now's the time to be working more in this space. So be ready to go. Unfortunately, as researchers, we tend to have a tendency to overcomplicate things. And again, this is something that I do a fair bit um, when trying to explain things as well. And I'm just conscious of time, so I'll try and move along a bit quicker. But I wanted to give uh, some actionable steps of what we could do to simplify things and some key points to consider. So going back to the main question, how do we build a policy-focused research project and get it used? You've got to make sure you stand out from the crowd. So think about how you're going to achieve that. Make sure you have the right skills and expertise within your team. Make sure you have consumer representation, end user representation, policymakers, views incorporated. If you've ever heard of something like the Cotter's behaviour change model, you want to have these people engaged from the beginning because if they feel a sense of ownership um, and contribution to your work, they'll make sure it's used. They're not just going to let their time go to waste. Is your reasoning logical for my work is going to change policy? Is that, is, is it really? Um, you want to make your, your the, the pathway clear. You want to say, I can get from A to B and from B to C. 
and make that really clear in your research grants, in your policy briefs, whatever it is that you're creating. Importantly, try and map a multifaceted pathway to impact. Don't just rely on policy. And if you're doing policy, don't just rely on one policy avenue because there's often lots of ways that you can approach something. And the more connections and pathways you have, the more likely that one of them will pay off. Be ready to pivot and iterate. Again, this is because policy is dynamic. The policy windows are dynamic. Have your finger on the pulse. Understand who the other people are working in this space. Try to work with them or you're going to have to somehow be better than them I guess it's it's not even that because I'm my approach is often more collaborative if I've got somebody else working in this space we're all working towards the same goal of impact you need to make sure that you have that big view of what's going on um how do you get heard it's reality is there's finite resources there's finite attention of policymakers. so often we'll start out with something that we think is clear this is what I'm going to do um but then by the end of a project it's like oh this is what we actually need again that was a really nice image from Carmel before where you saw the the different lenses of from what the customer wanted to watch how they described it again be aware of what else is going on around you which I've already said um you want to keep it simple so things like elevator pitches three points for your whole body of research and run it past other people. Why think about the political lens? Why are they going to care? Why are they going to invest their time into translating your work for policy or practice? Start small. So for this one, it's when I wanted to change some policy, um, again, around the tobacco space, I was asking for the big things. Like I want, this is what has to happen. This is the big picture. Well, if you start small, like, oh, I just need a smaller bit of money or a small um, wording change for a policy or something like that, you then start to build a relationship. And here you have a principle of sunk costs. So often when someone can invest their time or efforts into you, they'll continue doing that because they've started that relationship. So that could be a good way just to get your foot in the door. And again, it's about always being at the ready. Be ready for that policy window and network, network, network. So where do you actually start with all of this? Um, again, there's a lot of different places you can start and it can be pretty overwhelming. The best thing you could do is consider your field and what's going on in your field. What are the policies in your field? Really understanding that. Start in your comfort zone where you feel that you could make an impact because you've done similar things before. And then start with just one thing. And say, by the end of the week, have a clear goal. I'm going to reach out to five people and hopefully one of them will get back to you and you can start the conversations there. And just like with anything else, how do you approach it? You might have heard of the saying, you know, how do you eat an elephant? And it's one bite at a time. So thank you for your talk. And sorry for some parts of that where I had verbal diarrhea. Um, but look forward to if you've got any questions. Thank you, Kristen. A fantastic presentation. And I think really practical. So I'm hoping that there's a lot that um, everyone was able to take away from that. I know I certainly took a lot away. And I think reflecting back on both of the presentations we've had today, certainly the things that have really stuck with me is just the sheer complexity of like this policy ecosystem. And, and really, you know, as researchers, it might be easy for us to assume that everything's evidence-based, but when, when you take a look at it, like really it's, um, you know, political, both big P and little P, as both our presenters have said. And then also, I think my other huge takeaway is just that it's not even importance, but how vital the relationships are in this space and engaging early and engaging with the right people. Um, I'd love if any of our attendees could um, pop any questions in the Q&A. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I think while we wait, um, I know, Kristen, you talked a lot about kind of understanding the landscape and really trying to find out, you know, who are the actors and who, I guess, who are the movers and shakers. If people are starting out, you know, brand new and they've got a particular policy area that they want to explore more and they kind of want to find out, who's who in the zoo, um, you know, in terms of ministers, advisors, et cetera. Is there any like, good, easy place to start? Yeah, your supervisors, your mentors. Fantastic. Ask them. Go to your professional societies as well. You know, people are always willing to give their advice, you know, because they want to feel important. Um, so if you can just speak to the people that you already know within your network, then ask them. So snowball it out. Start small and then just build it up. 
That's so true. And I think probably sometimes we forget what a wealth of knowledge our networks can be, um, if, particularly if there's questions that we haven't necessarily approached with them before. They probably will have um, a lot to share with us. So last chance, if anyone has any questions for Kristen um, or even anything based on Carmel's presentation that we can cover for you in these last couple of minutes. Otherwise, perhaps we can finish up early and let everyone have an early minute back to whatever they need to do at one o'clock. Yeah, we'll right. have to there. So, and I'm sure Carmel will be happy as well to field any email or calls. So if you have anything, just please reach out. Terrific. Thanks again. I'm just going to share my screen um, just to finish up the presentation today. So um, as I've said at the beginning of the press, we've got four webinars running um, throughout the month uh, to promote research policy partnerships. So this is the second in the series. So we've got two more left. And next week, we've got another fantastic session coming up. We've got Julie Ann Mitchell and Dr. Beck O'Hara um, presenting at that. And yeah, I think some a really good case study there, but also um, Julie will certainly have some great experiences to share um, from her role. And then that's it from us. Um, as always, please feel free to get in touch um, with our presenters based on the details that they provided, but you can also reach out to us at Health Translation SA if you think of anything later or, um, you know, if there's been something that's inspired you that you want to know more about in a subsequent Spotlight series, we're always happy to hear from you. So please feel free to reach out. And based on that, I'll close off the session today. Thank you so much for attending.